So I'm an ethnoecologist. I study people and the environment. So in other words, I could study just about everything. And I'm focusing on climate change and indigenous peoples in this talk because I want to put a face on climate change. Um, and I want to bring the diversity of the world experiences to all of you here in this conference. I don't know how many of you are familiar with David Suzuki, but he said something that many scientists have been said. He just said it more eloquently. And we always know, we've known that humans change the planet in physical ways, in chemical ways, and in biological ways. But right now, we are in the era of the Anthropocene, which means that we humans have become an unprecedented force. We are changing the planet on the scale that David Suzuki calls a geological scale. In other words, we have put into motion, we are now beyond the tipping point, we can't, we can't change things anymore, um, at least for the next 50 years, but we're setting into motion um, processes that will go on for centuries and possibly millennia. These are our greenhouse gases, if you're not already familiar with them. Um, we've added a fifth, which is sul sulfur hexafluoride. Um, the one that we'll be talking the most about today is carbon dioxide, um, which is the leader uh, in terms of most of the changes that we're seeing, but methane is also incredibly potent. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the International Panel on Climate Change um, and their data. Um, it's probably a little hard to wade through the data because it is hundreds and thousands of pages, which may be part of why it's hard in getting this message out in very succinct points. But if you look at this slide, just look at how parallel all of the graphs are. Starting with carbon dioxide in the upper left, going down to methane, over to nitrous oxide in the right, and radioactive forcing or temperature. Every single one of these graphs, the scale, is going back 20,000 years to the present. And you can see how all of these lines are going exponentially. So we're measuring climate change not on just one metric, but on many metrics. In this talk, I'm going to cover climate change data, how climate change is impacting native cultures, how our life choices are impacting others, because every time you see a human being in this slide, um, I hope you realize that what we do here um, in the United States, whether it's in New York or California, is leading to impacts on the people who I'm talking about in these slides. And I'm going to talk about how we can turn things around. Native peoples are at the forefront of climate change. They have been, they are, they will be. And it's one of the great ironies that the people who are least contributing to climate change, so whose lifestyles have the least impact on greenhouse gases, on the warming temperatures, on the ocean rise, on the melting of the glaciers, right now these are the people who are being impacted the most. Again, I don't know how familiar all of you are with the data. Um, this is data now from 800,000 years to the present. And the natural carbon dioxide range is indicated by the hyphenated lines, the broken lines. And we are no longer in this range. Um, as of yesterday, when I checked, we were at 400.26 parts per million carbon dioxide. This is on average, uh, which means in some places on the planet, it's going to be higher, on some places lower. So the question of, is this natural, is no longer a question. Um, scientists have been able to identify carbon isotopes in the atmosphere to determine which carbon isotopes were placed there by the dinosaurs, which by us, and right now, um, one in every three of those isotopes that are in the atmosphere, those are placed by us, humans. So we know that dramatic changes in average, average global temperatures, again, both highs and lows, that's why, it, why we now call it climate change instead of global warming, because the planet isn't just warming. 
There are some places that are getting cooler. What we're seeing is altered precipitation re regimes. So it's, it's as if we're, um, we're turning the volume up on extreme weather events um, and heightened storm patterns. What does this look like around the world? Well, in much of Uganda, increased drought. So drought is something that people have already adapted to, but the cycles are now out of whack. And it threatens everything that people's livelihoods depend upon. In specific areas, many farmers will save seeds rather than buy them. That's what food security is, the ability to replant seeds that you own and that you've cultivated and that you inherited from your grandmother and your great-great-grandmother. Well, many farmers can't do that um, because they literally can't grow out their seeds because there is not enough rain. In Kenya, um, we're seeing increased erosion. That, too, leads to decreases in food security. And in areas where people had carved out furrows for irrigation, um, they can't do that anymore. Uh, they have to farm closer and closer to the river, uh, which also leads to this positive feedback loop where increased erosion causes increased erosion. In Central America, um, climate variability is causing greatly increased out migration, um, including in areas like Chiapas, Mexico, which again, this is a place which is known for its sustainability, known for its biodiversity and its resilient people. In India, uh, climate change and increasing deforestation is causing much higher levels of out migration than we've seen before. And in other parts of Africa and the world, this resource scarcity is leading to conflict. And that's why for so many nations, their defense departments are actually leading the charge um, to deal with climate change. Um, here in the, Pen in the United States, the Pentagon does see climate change as a matter of national and international security. The Berber of North Africa. Um, when we have systems where there is still a very classic system or high feudalization or sharecropping, it is the most marginalized people who are impacted the most. And here uh, with this tribe, there are still folks where half of their crops go to their landlords. And you can imagine the impacts when their resources are diminished further. For the Aka people in Asia, they and many other farmers are seeing increased pests and in some cases increased diseases. That then um, impacts the quality of their crops. So even if they're able to grow their crops to full term, um, the, the quantity and also the quality is diminished, which again leads to decreasing incomes. In Central Africa, um, the Baka people have uh, historically survived on fishing and gathering and hunting. And as the water patterns change, they cannot fish like they used to. In Nui, um, in the Pacific, because of the higher frequency of cyclones, that is then uprooting trees that they depend on as their essential equipment for fishing. And as this student very accurately puts it, no trees, no canoes. No canoes, no fishing. No fishing, no food. On Borneo, the Dayak tribes, who are historically migrant, um, semi-migrants, so they, they tend to go out uh, for long distances um, to hunt and to gather, and they're used to finding certain species associated um, sorry, certain animal or um, bird species associated with certain tree species. And those tree species tend to fruit or flower um, at a given point in time. And those fruiting and flowering cycles are linked to climate, to both local climate and global climate. And roots that the uh, Dayak tribesmen used to take for centuries through the forest where they knew, okay, if I go to this fig tree at this time, I know that I'm going to find this sort of animal. 
those patterns have altered so dramatically that oftentimes diac hunters will show up um, under a certain tree and wait for weeks. And they are not seeing that fruiting and flowering and associated species showing up. Also in Hawaii, we're seeing climate change impacting the biodiversity, not just of plants and animals, but of endemic species. So these are species that are only found on Hawaii. Um, and this is true for many island nations. There are plants and animals and insects and fungi and mammals who have developed over millennia and who, who can't be found anywhere else. And they don't have enough time to adapt. Normally, species will adapt over centuries. Now, we're trying to ask species to adapt within one to two generations. Here in the Pacific Northwest, salmon is one of our key ecological species as well as a species that has infinite importance to hundreds of cultures. And our salmon, you may know that our native Pacific salmon have already been hit by overfishing and by dams and by habitat destruction. And climate change may be that last straw on the camel's back. We may lose all of our species of salmon. One of our species of salmon here where I live in Mendocino County, the coho salmon, that used to number in the millions, on many of our tributaries, we either find no coho or we can count them on one hand. In Eurasia, for many communities, it's this shifting, this change, this unpredictability that impacts rural families and rural households who rely on some relative amount of predictability so that they can plan ahead. Climate change is impacting the Sami people who are also a migratory people. Um, they are the traditional reindeer herders. And normally reindeer feed off lichen, uh, which grows um, in woodland forests like this one. And for the first time in history, the Sami now have to search for fodder to feed their reindeer herds because there just isn't enough lichen. At high altitudes and high elevations, people are being impacted as well. When warming surface temperatures create those drier conditions, everyone in the, in the lower elevations is impacted. And in areas where glaciers are melting, and we're going to talk about that later in just a little bit, um, such as Tibet, there are certain plant species that only exist, endemic plant species that only exist at high elevations. They only exist in certain small populations on mountaintops where it's very dry and it's very cold. And that little bit of precipitation is what keeps those populations alive. But when that population disappears, those medicinal plants disappear. And if you're in a community where the nearest hospital is five days walk away. This is a big deal. So just as we saw on the earlier data and the graphs where all of the, the lines were going up exponentially, um, on this graph we're seeing an exponential increase but in the other direction. Um, increased glacier retreat uh, since 1960 uh, is following a pattern everywhere. Um, you're going to see some before and after shots in this slide, um, as well as others, where um, glaciers that we depended on as human beings for millennia um, are disappearing. In Africa, on Mount Kilimanjaro, um, I think these photos speak for themselves. Uh, you can see how the summit of this mountain um, is virtually bare uh, and it's lost almost 90% of its glacial ice and that we may lose this glacier in 30 years. 
This impacts everyone downslope. Uh, the Chaga people who live and farm on those slopes are seeing greatly decreased crop yields, and yet their populations are still growing. In the Renzori Mountains, again, very high glacier loss, and Lake Victoria is the largest lake in Africa. There are millions of people who rely on Lake Victoria. And that lake has already been subjected to an invasive species, the Nile perch, which has decimated the native cichlid populations. So time and time again, we're seeing where we humans, through habitat destruction or through the introduction of invasive species or through environmental pollution, we've, we've hammered ecosystems that we rely on. And just as climate change is ramping up the volume on extreme weather events, Climate change is ramping up the volume on negative ecosystem destruction. And it may be that, that straw on a million different camel's backs that pushes so much of what's been teetering on the edge over that edge. In Alaska, retreating glaciers are possibly having the most immediate prevalent and diverse impacts. Um, many Native Alaskan villages are located along the shores and they have been destroyed either by flooding or coastal erosion um, because waves that used to stay far enough back from the village are now overwhelming those villages. But it's not just in Alaska that um, people are feeling the impacts immediately. Because glacier melt is causing our sea level to rise, there are species other than humans, um, like this leatherback turtle, whose habitat is disappearing as coastal areas disappear. And something we talk about in our Nature and World Cultures class a lot is how Species who are culturally significant, who play a part in Native people's lifestyles, life ways, songs, stories, myths, legends, um, belief systems, when those disappear, the very core of Native peoples is destroyed. Rising sea levels elsewhere. Um, whether it's Guyana or Bangladesh, and we'll see in a later slide, um, there, there are maps of the world that show the percent of the world's populations that live next to an ocean um, or who live at less than 100 meters above sea level. It's somewhere between a third and a half of our, of our entire world's population. And people aren't just being displaced. When we have sudden floods in areas such as avalanches and glacier lake outburst floods, people die. And people can die quickly in a flood or they can die slowly as water sources disappear. Climate scientists were first alerted to the immediate impacts of climate change by elders in the Arctic Circle. And it was elders talking about how the permafrost, the soil that used to be permanently frozen, had never thawed in their lifetimes or in their stories or in their memories. And yet that permafrost is now melting. And for Gwich'in, Inupiat, Athabascan, Yupik people, the permafrost is their refrigerator. Um, it's where they store their meat. It's how they survive their winters. But the permafrost isn't permanent anymore.
and the overall decrease in predictability, the changes that have never occurred in our lifetimes or in our grand or great, great, great grandparents' lifetimes is not just having a material, tangible impact. It's having an immaterial or an intangible impact in that entire knowledge systems are at risk. The, the wisdom that has allowed peoples to survive and adapt to changes, that's being lost as well. So as we look at this rise in overall temperatures and rise in carbon dioxide levels, we're also seeing a rise in oceanic heat content. And initially, when scientists began measuring climate change, we said to ourselves, oh, um, the ocean will help mitigate climate change. Um, the ocean can serve as this great carbon sink, and it can serve as this temperature sink. Um, well, it could to a point. Um, and now the ocean doesn't have the capacity to absorb effectively any more carbon or heat. Increased ocean temperatures are impacting fish production. Increasing ocean temperatures are changing where sea mammals can rest, which is critical to their uh, maintaining their body heat and their physiology. Um, it is changing entire populations within food chains, which then change food webs. And I remember saying to my graduate students, if you wanted to draw an oceanic food web, you would need hundreds of graduate students with thousands of markers trying to draw arrows and circles and lines over a 20-story building just to show one oceanic food web. So the, the domino effect of these changes is, is mind-boggling. I don't even know if we can model, model it as scientists. So we have seen overall a four centimeter rise in the ocean, in the sea level on average. Again, in some areas it's going to be higher, in some areas it's going to be lower. These sea levels are displacing people. Here's that figure again, that 80% figure. 80% of the 1200 islands of the Maldives lie no more than one meter above sea level. So presidents of island nations like Kiribati are buying land in other islands, thinking that their population is not going to be able to survive on their homelands for the rest of this generation. And again, it's not just coastal erosion, it's the intrusion of the sea, both on land and within freshwater systems. And just as climate change has a series of impacts in food webs, in the ocean, and on land with natural bioorganisms, it has impacts with humans too. So in addition to rising sea levels, we are seeing global ocean acidification and Acidification is happening because with the increased concentration of carbon dioxide, there are an increasing amount of free hydrogen molecules available. And those free hydrogen molecules are decreasing the pH. So if you have more hydrogen, you have more acidic concentrations. And what it also means is that those hydrogen molecules are causing this biochemical feedback loop where they are binding with the carbonate. And the carbonate is, is, is then binding with the calcium. And calcium is this critical component of bone, of skeletons, of shells, of 
plankton, like this creature. This is a pteropod, and it's beautiful. If you look at the shell, you can see how delicate and fragile the shell is of this pteropod. And pteropods, along with other types of zooplankton and phytoplankton, are at the basis of food webs for our oceans. They need calcium to build their shells. The shells of the pteropod are eroding. Zooxanthellae. These are a type of algae species that lives in symbiosis with clams and with coral reefs, and they're very sensitive. If the water is too hot or it's too acidic, or if the water is too deep and sunlight can't go in, um, these zooxanthellae flee. And when they flee, their hosts die. And when their hosts die, they turn white. And that's what coral, coral bleaching is about. And the pteropods and the coral are these nodes in the webs of life in the ocean. And as these webs are pulled apart and they're frayed and there are holes, all of us are impacted. In Australia, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are partnering with the government to measure and monitor coral bleaching but there's not much else we can do. Um, once coral is bleached and it dies, um, that coral, which may have taken decades or centuries or millennia to grow because different types of coral grow at different paces, different speeds. Some coral will grow at the rate of a millimeter a year. Some coral will only grow a millimeter every 10 years. And for some coral, it takes much longer. When that coral is dead, we will have to wait several hundred years for it to come back. Recently, I had the pleasure to read Barbara Kingsolver's novel, Flight Behavior. Um, it's a fictional story where um, a young woman, a mother, um, finds these new colonies of monarchs in the hills above her home in um, the eastern United States. And she ends up pairing with a scientist to understand why have the monarchs been blown so far off their course? Um, how did they end up there? And Dr. Ovid Byron is, is this scientist, this character in the story. And this quote from him that scientists used to call these things the canary in the mine, um, he says, we're at the top of Niagara Falls in a canoe. We got there by drifting, but we cannot turn around for a lazy paddle back when you finally stop pissing around. We have arrived at the point of an audible roar. Does it strike you as a good time to debate the existence of the falls? As scientists, we also have a principle known as the precautionary principle. And it's simple, similar to the Hippocratic Oath, which is first do no harm. So the precautionary principle says that if there is a chance that what we are doing can cause irreparable harm then we stop doing it, or we just, we, we don't do it anymore. So what can we do? Um, this is me digging a hole for a tree um, on Borneo. First thing we need to do, 
Recycling is fine, but we need to demand much stricter le legislation and tighter deadlines for our governments. We have to get out into the streets, like 400,000 of us did um, a few months back. I also believe in personal change. I believe that we need to overhaul how we live. We need to stop flying. I am so grateful to the conference organizers and to Michelle for everything that she did so that I didn't have to get on an airplane to talk to you because I don't want to get on any more airplanes. We need to invest in solutions. We actually should all have some solar panel somewhere, whether it's a backpack solar panel or it's something that you stick out in your front lawn to teach your neighbors about. And we need to educate and inspire others. Um, I used to be the scientist who stuck to writing papers. Then I became the scientist who started speaking out in class. Um, now I'm the scientist who, um, who quotes scripture. Um, I have many friends who are Muslim and Buddhist and Jewish and agnostic and atheistic and pagan. Um, and yet I found myself remembering this statement from the New Testament that um, kind of a revised version of we are all connected. We're all related. What we do, how we shop, how often we get into our cars, um, what we eat and how we eat it impacts other people, impacts all of us. So I hope that we're all inspired to really do something and to change. Thank you.